everybody. Hello, Professor. Hello, Professor Thomas. Professor Pauline, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. That was uh, one of the uh, videos that we have received from our sponsor for our program. Laura, can you stop the uh, video, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Professor Thomas, how are you? Thank you very much. And Professor Bolin and all of you from everywhere, thanks for joining us. We still have five minutes to officially start our uh, journal club. Hello, Professor Miglani. Hello, everyone. Professor Miglani is the head of the Educational Committee of APEC. Sanjay, please go ahead. Yeah, on behalf of APEC, I welcome you all. And uh, let's have a great time. I think Dr. Nikufar will do a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay, for joining us. I hope you are doing very well in this uh, very difficult situation of uh, COVID-19. How is the situation in India now? Uh, the situation is improving now, so we don't have much cases. Uh, the positivity rate has come to 2% now, so we are okay. This wave was manageable, actually. Good to hear that. Good to hear that. Okay, uh, before uh, we uh, are officially start, I'm going to tell you the story of this journal club uh, because... Uh, I think now it is more than a year that uh, we are uh, doing this and uh, we have received a lot of good feedback from around the world about this journal club. Uh, we start actually this work by inviting the first authors and corresponding authors and all the co-authors of various publications from around the world. And then... Uh, we start actually discussing with them about the methodology of the publication and everything. And the good thing is now of young fellows and the resident postgraduate students from around the world, they know how to read an article, which is very, very important to us, I believe. It is sometimes even more important than writing an article, because when we write an article, we know how to select the publication. But for clinicians, for young fellows, that they want actually to choose the best way to uh, practice, they need actually how to select the best article and how to critically appraise an article to start it, actually. Uh, So we are also waiting for our appraiser from uh, Turkey, uh, Dr. Fatima Betul Bashturk, and she just sent me uh, a text that she is trying to enter. So I'm going to help her for that. Sorry for one minute, please. I hope you can manage to join us. Okay. All right, now we have all the authors with us as well. So I'm going to ask uh, authors to introduce themselves and have some introduction while we are waiting for Fatima Batul to join us. Okay, we have actually a greeting from Nigeria. Thank you very much, Dona, for joining us. And it will be really good if everybody feel free to turn on the videos, then we can see all the faces and it helps uh, the presenter and the authors to see you all and make it like a real situation rather than a virtual communication. Okay, Professor Thomas Quist, if I pronounce your name correctly, please go ahead and introduce your colleagues to us as well and uh, teach us how to pronounce the names as well. Thank you very much. 
and I really appreciate for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Mohammed, and everybody else. And good evening, uh, Saturday evening here in in Dork, Sweden, at this time. And um, uh, we are so uh, we are very glad that you invited us to be able to discuss our paper here together with you. And th this paper is an uh, outspring from uh, a big research effort made in the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And from, uh, from that group who was the starters of these uh, studies, which were called the Parokrank studies, is uh, associate professor from Karolinska Institute, Corey Bullin, who's with us tonight as well, one of the authors of papers. Okay, so uh, the, can you pronounce his name again, please? Carl Bullin, am I right? Kore Bullin. Kore Bullin. Yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. welcome Kore. Thank you very much for accepting and yeah. joining this platform. Thank and you, then, Professor Nekofar. Perhaps most important of everyone here is the, the main author, the first author of this paper is uh, uh, Don Sebring, who is a PhD student of, of us, where I is the main supervisor, and he's a uh, part of the Sorgensk Academy in Gothenburg University, University of Gothenburg, Sweden. And uh, Hi, Dan, you did a great job. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Although um, we are going to put you in a very hot chair and we are going to ask a lot of questions. Be uh, ready for that. <laughs> uh, that's good because that's a good training experience for him to for the upcoming dissertations and uh, my name is Thomas Christ and I'm an associate professor also at the Sorgenska University Sorgenska Academy of University of Gothenburg and uh, I am the main supervisor of uh, of Dawn and I'm also the so to be the the yeah the taking the initiative for making these endodontic part of the Paroprank um, project that we are to, doing together with the Karolinska in, in Stockholm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for this uh, introduction. So we have also Pro uh, Dr. Fatima Betul Bashturk, Associate Professor from Marmara University. But Fatima, please uh, introduce yourself to everybody. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nekufar, uh, for the introduction. And thank you very much for all, uh, to all the participants who joined us together uh, today. Uh, I'm Fatima Betul Bashturk, uh, and uh, I'm actually no longer at Marmar University. I changed my university. <clears throat> okay. uh, I'm an anodontist, and um, we have uh, a lot of work with Dr. Nekufar. Uh, and he kindly invited me to be the appraiser today for uh, this paper. And I'm very happy um, to be here, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Fatima. And I'm very happy and very proud to say that we have two visiting professors from Tehran University of Medical Sciences. The first one is Professor Sanjay Miglani who is also the chair of the Educational Committee of APEC, and also Fatima Betul Bashturk as well. She is also one of the visiting professor of endodontic department of Tehran University of Medical Sciences, which I affiliated to. However, this program is actually a program that uh, we do that uh, with collaboration with Asian Pacific Endodontic Confederation, and the Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and I'm proudly moderate that. What we do without any hesitation, we are going to put the authors in a very hot chair and start asking our questions. And usually uh, at the end, we are going to say sorry for very harsh questions. So please be ready for that. And all the participants, uh, they can type their questions if they like in the chat room and you can read them. And also if they like actually to speak, they can raise electronically their hands and we turn on the microphone and they can speak. So 
uh, because I know we are going to have a very, very long discussion and we want to finish in 90 minutes. So I'm going to ask Fatima Batul to start and share the presentation with us. And Fatima, the stage is yours, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Now I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, please. Okay. So. Okay, is it on? Yes, yes, we can see that very well. All right. Uh, once again, uh, thanks uh, to all the uh, authors uh, to be here. Um, and I'm very happy to be uh, hosting this one, uh, Professor Thomas Quist and Kare Bowling. I think it's the correct pronunciation. And, Close enough. Uh, ah, thank you. Close enough. <laughs> And also Don Sebring. Is it tr true? No? If not, please correct me. Um, that was very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, so uh, today I'm going to be the appraiser and also Dr. Nazi Nizargar is an honorary appraiser for today. And uh, I would like to start with a quick um, reminder for those who have read the article beforehand and also it's going to be a little summary for those who haven't read the article. So uh, the question was, uh, is there a relationship between endodontic inflammatory disease, uh, which is called as EID, and uh, a first myocardial infarction? And uh, the Groups were of 805 patients in the experience of MI uh, versus healthy controls. Um, it says that my internet connection is unstable. Can you uh, see it? Yeah, yeah please continue. It, it, it works. It works Fine. okay. Yeah. Yes, Fatima, okay. we can see. All right. So uh, the findings were missing teeth may cause an increased risk of a first MI, so is endodontic uh, inflammatory disease. So uh, this is a quick summary of the Uh, it seems, Fatima, your internet connection is not very good, but... To, uh, uh, get into the Pico. Internet connection is a problem, has a problem. Okay. Okay, now it's better. If you turn off other bar. devices is, is and okay? just... Yes, yes, yes it's, it's fine now. Devices. Um, okay. So uh, the population is patients with a history of a recent myocardial infarction. So my first question uh, to the doctors is, what is uh, classified as a recent myocardial infarction? Okay, so if I understand uh, the question, the question is, what is the recent MI? When you say MI, what is the definition of the recent for that? Am I right, Fatima? Yes, I think Fatima is disconnected and try to reconnect. Uh, while we are waiting for Fatima to come back, maybe uh, one of you kindly can answer the question. Yeah, um, yeah. My my, uh, my co-authors uh, could very well um, yeah, it's gone. Uh, yeah. say something, but um, I think the the subjects in this study. I can answer that first, Don, if you want to. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. Please go on, Don. Go on. Okay. Uh, because the subjects of this study, they were recruited uh, during their hospital stay. Um, uh, for the diagnosis of a myocardial infarction and 
I'm not the best one to tell you exactly how how that is diagnosed in uh, in the med medical field, uh, but I guess it's uh, by the SD elevations uh, and such. But uh, they were recruited uh, in conjunction with the, the emergency stay at the hospital, so that must account for a recent myocardial infarction, but. Cora perhaps could have a better answer than... Basically, you're totally right, Dan. I could just fill in that it's from the, the, the recent MI was eight weeks or a little bit more before the dental examination. So, so uh, it's eight, eight weeks or more uh, from the MI until the dental panoramic x-ray as well as the dental examination within the within the dentist's uh, office mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay good. and as I don don said it's elevated it's from the they are recruited from the er unit and they have survived their first myocardial infarction uh all, all of them have had their first ones those who have had a second one or third one was excluded. Okay. So the goal was to select the first MI and also the recent, it means recently in eight weeks at least. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Uh, while Fatima, because Fatima sent me a text and she's trying to come back with a better uh, connection. While she is coming back, I'm going to ask uh, also another question, which is about the methodology, because the methodology in general, uh, you mentioned that it is a part of a cohort study that was uh, performing for some other reasons, and you selected some of the cases for this study. So in that situation, your study wasn't a cohort. It was like a cross-sectional, am I right? Basically, it's a cohort. Uh, it's, it's a cohort from the 1,600 uh, patients that was recruited, and that was patients and controls all over the kingdom, from the north to the south, from the west to the east. Mm -hmm. and. Um, then we have all of these patients and controls are within the endodontic uh, research uh, investigation as well. So it's not it's not a cohort from from the first sample. It's all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, let me let me uh, change my question in that way. Was it a longitudinal study or just a cross-sectional study in terms of the cohort? Because you just select the cases from the study and this wasn't like a longitudinal or following the cases like that. Uh, am I right about that? No, we are following them now. So it's a longitudinal study ongoing it's still ongoing ongoing about the uh, and looking at the endodontic lesion as an indicator in this study as well yes uh, yes, yes we're, we're gonna look at uh, endodontic variables as well uh, uh, uh -huh. so, so yes Okay, I think there, there is a comment from one of our participants, uh, Farhan Razakhan, please go ahead, ask your questions. Yeah, because um, um, am can I- Can you introduce audible? yourself, please, Farhan? Can you introduce yourself okay. from, from which university, yeah. which country? Yeah, I am from Karachi, Pakistan. I work as an associate professor in operative dentistry and endodontics in Aachan University Hospital. And I'm associate. I'm an associate program director of the residency program. So um, what I have read, I've just read the article, some part of it, but it's clear that it's a nested case control uh, of a matched case control design, because mm -hmm. they have you know selected cases to begin with. Had it been a cohort study, then it would have been exposed versus non-exposed. But it's clear from the PDF that it's, they have selected cases and controls. So once you select the patient uh, who already have disease, 
or cases, then it becomes a retrospective investigation. Now, you may argue that it was part of a big cohort, but in that case, it would be a nested case control uh, in which matching was done. So in my opinion, it's a clear example of matched case control investigation. Thank you. So what do you think? Carr or others, please go ahead. Uh, I would agree with that, that this paper that we are discuss discussing today, that it is rest retrospectively, um, and there's no, no denying that, but the project, the Parokrank project and the collaboration with the periodontologist that, that we have, we're gonna follow these patients and, and we have done it. So uh, it's part of a longitudinal study and a future paper. Yeah, longitudinal study, we can accept that, but it is like a case control study rather than a cohort study. Can we, can, do you accept such a thing? Because you already mentioned such a thing in the text as well. I think Fatima is connected and Fatima can also uh, raise uh, her concern Question. as well. Question, yes. Yes. Uh, actually, so sorry about the unstable internet. Um, so sorry about that. So uh, I think you already started discussing my second question, uh, the study design. So um, I'm wondering, um, actually I missed some part of it, but uh, as I saw that, I'm going to ask this one. No, Fatima, you can, you can carry on uh, your presentation. Okay, I can, okay. And then we go I'm back to this question. Don't worry, I All just, right. Uh, yep, All right. please. All right, so uh, patients with a history of a recent MI uh, is the population. So the investigated condition was the effect of endodontic inflammatory disease. And the comparison condition was health patients with no history of myocardial infarction. The outcome of interest was real infarction according to an endodontic inflammatory disease or not. So this was our PICO. Uh, actually, my first question was the, what is the study design? Uh, because uh, it says that the Parok Rank uh, is a Swedish prospective case control project and that this study was actually based on this one. So what I wonder was uh, the study design. Okay, maybe we can go back to that. Mm. Yeah. So do, so, do you want to explain the methodology? Because this is the main question. I will try. And a study yeah. design. Please, Dan, go ahead, please. Uh, so the Parukrank study is a case control study uh, on uh, MI patients with recent experience of uh, MI. Uh, and as Cora said before, it's uh, patients recruited from the ER and the dental examination was done uh, at maximum eight weeks later. So that's what constitutes a recent MI for these patients. Um, and it is a case control study with uh, subjects recruited uh, at the, the moment of, of disease or how you, you could say it. But what we have done is that we have looked at all the full material, all these patients, not, not just pick some of them or a sample, it's the complete material and looked at endodontic aspects of these patients uh, for this paper. So can okay, we say that it's a case, case control study or? Uh, yeah, a, uh, a case control study, yeah. May, case may control I say study. something? Sure, so Professor. I, I think there is perhaps um, some kind of misunderstanding because we have to make us uh, distinguish between what is the paracrine project, which is, a, which is going to be a, a follow-up study of, of those patients and their controls that had a first myocardial infarct. But this actual paper that we are discussing now, this is a mesh control study a, a, examining um, and comparison, uh, comparing the MI patients with, the, with their match controls at baseline, so to speak. And in the coming, in the future, we will have data 
to know what will happen both with those that have the first myocardial infarct and the controls in the long run. And uh, currently we are we are working on that. Um, the paracrine group is working on that and to see what what uh, things happen, deaths, another myocardial infarct, a stroke or whatever uh, in a period of up to seven years after the inclusion into the study. So, so it's so we have to distinguish between the project per se and this paper per se, which this paper is a is a match control study. Match control study. Yeah. Okay, thank you, professor. So uh, when I first read your article, actually, uh, I just uh, kind of uh, remembered the Netflix documentary called The Rook House which was banned later on due to the press release of uh, several endodontic associations, including the American Endodontic Association. Uh, the producers claim that people having RCTs on the right hand side per se, are more likely to have breast cancer on the same side. So um, the question is, does correlation equal causation? And what was your main motive in conducting this study? Uh, I think we were equally upset when we saw this uh, movie in, uh, at Netflix. And uh, have you watched it? Uh, yes, yes, uh, I've seen it, and uh, yeah, uh, it's um, upsetting. Yeah, it, yeah, it's upsetting, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, very, very special. And um, and as you said, uh, that they correlate uh, cancer on the same side with the, the teeth and all that. Uh, I think they um, undermine themselves uh, quite a bit. But, um, so this study is done because I think the, it's easy to make these assumptions just reading all these articles that correlate uh, infections with uh, systemic diseases. Uh, and I think the, the question uh, validate um, it's valid to, to, to continue to research this topic because uh, it might be uh, some kind of connections, but you can't make these assumptions based on uh, the findings right now, not between uh, endodontic diseases and, and uh, not between perio as well, I think. Uh, so you have to be careful and uh, conduct uh, well-designed studies uh, uh, and be careful how you, what you write, uh, and how, what words you choose when you present the results, so that they are not interpreted in the in the wrong way. Um, so I guess it was to uh, show that this this film uh, is not accurate, actually. Uh, I know that your study actually started way before this one um, because the study took time between May 2010 and February 2014. So uh, we can say that it has been more than eight years now uh, since the population was investigated. So what were the main obstacles in gathering the information or preparing the study? I mean, what took it this long? The Paraclank study, it, it's, uh, they're trying to uh, investigate the, the connection between marginal periodontitis and, and the first MI. Um, and I think we write that in the paper as well, that uh, that's, uh, that was the main reason for the Paraclank study. But I think these subjects are in need of collaborations between the different fields in dentistry. And uh, that's how this paper came to be. Um, a collaboration with the Paraclank uh, study group. And I guess that was established after the initiation of this project. project. Um, but maybe uh, Thomas and Kore, because they are more <laughs> responsible of that than, uh, than I am, could uh, tell you more about it. Uh, Dr. Kore. Yeah, well, um, Sweden is a much, much, much smaller country than, for instance, Turkey. That means that obtaining these kind of per person, uh, patient material and control material takes time. And yeah. you, have, you have the ability when you come, come to the ER to 
either die and then you're not included or you can survive and then you have the opportunity to say no. And several patients said no, they didn't want to participate. And also, um, doctors or hospitals as well as dentists said also no to, to be part of this. And that means that, that uh, of course, collecting uh, 1,600 uh, participants takes time. Yep. Yeah, we can we can say that it's a very very difficult situation. You are you did a very dedicated job. I can I can see that. Thomas, do you want to add something? Uh, um, perhaps only that. Uh, another reason is that this was originally uh, projected as as to evaluate the influence of peri marginal periodontitis. So it was it was not until I think in 2006, 15 or sixteen that. We, uh, we as an we as endodontists approached this group and asked for a collaboration. And that was actually after uh, um, uh, ESE, European Society of Endodontology, had a meeting in Amsterdam in 2014, when we decided that we would like to encourage uh, endodontic groups to collaborate with the greater groups, including periodontists and, and medical uh, researchers and um, so after that, we have had this, uh, we approached this group, paracrank group, and uh, set up this sort of subgroup with endocrank, as we call it nowadays. <laughs> so, and then it takes some time to, uh, to uh, evaluate all the radiographs. And so we presented one paper before this one, where we, where we have a method, methodology paper, where we describe how we, how we managed the, uh, the panoramic radiographs in a way so that we could show that we get the best out of the information that we could have from the panoramic radiographs. Uh, yeah, and, um, and so on. I mean, research takes time and that's, uh, we all know that, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Back, so, to, back to the previous question about the correlation and causation, if we want actually to uh, go back to that, because I want to actually ask another question. You mentioned that as an indicator, uh, so you looked at the endodontic infection as an indicator of MI rather than the cause of MI. Am I right about that? Because if it is the case, then it is like when I have, for example, a sneezing or I have cough, it is an indicator of, of COVID-19, such a thing. Is, is it the way that you try to show it to us? I don't know, Kor or Dan or Thomas, any of you, please. Of course, it's it's always uh, you always want to be able to to prove causation in some way. That would be uh, uh, really great. But I think none of us had uh, didn't think that we were going to be able to do that with this study. Uh, we have lots of studies that have shown associations between endodontic disease and systemic diseases, and I guess we we had the opportunity because this is a Good, good material. It's so many patients and match controls and lots of confounders that we have lots of information with not to use it. Um, but but I don't think uh, we have to have an, a different study design if we're going to be able to show causation and, and if we ever is going to be able to do it in in this regard because it's. It's complicated diseases, both endodontic disease and uh, cardiovascular disease. So uh, we have to be humble and uh, and know that it's going to be very difficult to uh, to show causation. Um, okay, good. Farhan, do you have a question? Please go ahead. Uh, yes, my point is, since it's a longitudinal study, and with the case control or even cohort, you can only show associations, cause and effect relation cannot be established until unless there is a clinical trial. So we cannot establish any form of causal relationship with such study designs. Only we can show associations. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, authors, do you agree? Yes, do you agree we, with yes, this we are totally aware of that. Okay, so you agree with this comment? Because one of the yeah. things is... Uh, this the study has... Uh, the, the, this study doesn't show an equation, no, as Don said. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, good. Because the thing is, the, the problem is the feedback sometimes uh, for people that they just read the abstract of some article, they say that, wow, there is a correlation. So when they see a correlation, they are worried about, wow, well, if we have an infection in our tooth, well, what should we do? We may need to extract it. Even we don't want any root canal treatment, it is dangerous for our heart. So we need to be very careful for uh, actually disseminating this information to our patients sometimes. So it has sometimes some indirect effect on them, even if we try to say that, don't worry, it is just an indicator. It is an risk indicator rather than something that we can say that it is the cause of the disease. So that is good actually to emphasize on that again. And thank you very much for confirming this idea. Okay, Fatima, please carry on. Okay, uh, actually I've got a, a question about the methodology as well. Uh, in the uh, article, it says that all radiographs were analyzed by three observers, and uh, but it doesn't uh, actually say uh, if the observers, the evaluators, were endodontists or radio radiology from the radiology department. Or uh, so, I was wondering who the three observers were and when uh, the X-rays were taken because it doesn't specifically say uh, when the x-rays were taken. I mean, after the uh, MI or before the MI. So uh, can you please specify this? Uh, so I, I think all the x-rays were taken after the MI, definitely uh, at the maximum eight weeks, um, the patients were um, scheduled for a, a visit to the dental clinic uh, near the hospital. Uh, and that's when the x-rays were taken. Kora could uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and correct. also for the, the recruited uh, health controls that were taken, uh, uh, I think approximately at the same time, um, perhaps a few weeks in between there. But uh, How do you justify the exposure to radiation for them? Because they don't have any compl complaint or they don't have any problems, any tooth problems, how do you justify the exposure to radiation? That is definitely an ethical dilemma to, uh, to expose these healthy patients with no problems to, to this panoramic uh, X-ray. But that's, um, I think that's, uh, that's a valid point uh, to use panoramic radiographs instead of something like full mouth uh, uh, taking all the pictures yeah. or CBCT even, um, that panoramic radiographs might be a bit nicer. Uh, um. And then are they precise enough to give you all the information that you need about the endodontic infection? Yeah, because that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a real problem. Uh, no, it's not uh, the best way, especially in endodontic diseases. Uh, absolutely not. But um, we have tried to manage that uh, the way we can. Uh, and uh, by having these three observers. And to answer your question, uh, these three, there were one general dentist uh, and two uh, dental students in their final year, actually, uh, that did all these uh, assessments of the radiographs. So uh, uh, why, why weren't the observers chosen from uh, the endodontists or from radiologists? And why did you actually choose these observers? Mm, yeah, why did we choose these? Oh, sorry. Um, I, I can think I can help there. Yes. I think that uh, actually to get the job done. And, get the uh, job done. Yeah, that's uh, it. That's so, it. Yeah, so we. Great answer. Yeah, and um, another comment here about the, the there is a, for those who are interested, we have a separate paper about the, how we did the evaluation of the panoramic radio. But I think that one thing, it's, oh, it's very important, as correct as you say, of course, that 
you you may miss quite a lot when you use panoramic radiographs and it's not as accurate as you would like it to be. But when you do a match control study, you have the benefit of, you have probably the same difficulties in both groups. So if you have, if you underdiagnose or overdiagnose or whatever you do, you you do the same in the both groups, so to speak. So, so the comparison, if you keep the false positive rate low, then the comparison between the groups will be justified, even if the, the correct, you will never reach the correct numbers. And you don't, will not do that even using CBCT because you, what you are after is, I mean, it's the inflammatory, inflammatory status of, of, of the teeth, which is impossible to, to judge even from, a, from a CBCT radiographs. So I think that just that is, the, the thing that is a match control study makes it easier to say something if there is a difference between the groups because probably the, the, the biases in, in interpretation of the radio are, is the same in both groups, so to speak. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, okay. We did, uh, Any other comments? Yeah, we did uh, calibrate the observers quite, quite well, or, or how you would say it. They, they, they went through a calibration process. Um, so we, we tried to uh, handle that that issue with not having specialists doing the assessments. So, uh, so this calibration I... was one of the questions that uh, we have received in the chat room as well. Thank you very much for mentioning that. Do you want me to elaborate on the calibration process or? Yes, because they, they said that at least we need some uh, calibration process and also some uh, a statistical test to make sure that they are in accordance with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we actually had uh, one endodontist and one radiologist. They looked at a sample of these uh, pictures, uh, the panoramic pictures, um, and they established by themselves a gold standard, if you will, a, a truth that uh, so many teeth have uh, periapical lesions and so many root filled teeth and so on. Uh, and then we had these three observers calibrated toward this gold standard. Uh, and we tested it at several times during the, during the study, uh, before calibration, directly after the calibration, and then some time after, after the calibration. Um, and yeah, I think we, we, we write that in paper that it wasn't a perfect score by any means uh, evaluated by Kappa. Uh, but also the, the specialists when they were doing the gold standard, they didn't agree uh, between themselves as well. So I think this is a problem that we're never gonna uh, be able to, to solve. You can't have perfect agreement between different observers or, or even within yourself because it depends on so many other factors, actually. So, um, but it's important that you handle it in some way, and this is the way we did it. Um, uh, be, because otherwise, you won't be able to uh, draw reliable conclusions from the, the findings that you eventually do when you have assessed the pictures. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much because you are a good appraiser as well. Thank you. <laughs> you already appraise yourself. This is good. This is good. When you critically appraise yourself, we don't have anything to say. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Fatima. Uh, okay, um, actually, um, the next question is about the methodology now. Um, in the paper, it says that a family history of cardiovascular diseases was more common in patients than in controls, and smoking was more frequent amongst the patients at admission. So how did you rule out, I mean, exclude the fact that the patient's group was a smoker group, hence more likely to have cardiovascular diseases, regardless of the DMFT score or the number of periapical lesions? Uh, I think we, we had smoking as a confounder in the statistical analysis yes. uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, to handle that, that issue. Um, 
I don't know if I have any better answer than that. Other authors, Corey or Thomas, do you want to say something about this question? Because that was a question that I have received from other participants as well about the number of the smokers. Obviously, this is a predisposing factor. Yes, and, and since you see that, that amongst the smokers at admission during after the myocardial infarction, quite a lot of them quit quitted smoking actually. So it was a lot less smokers in the end as in the beginning. Uh, so when they did the dental examination, um, many of them uh, actually quit had quit smoking due to the risk for dying. Since, since uh, uh, of course, there is a risk, risk for myocardial infarction if you smoke. Uh, yeah, but, the, uh, the groups were not actually equally distributed in terms of the smokers. So uh, no. my question was, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, that's what we are trying to tell you, that, that uh, smoking is a risk factor for my quality therefore uh, among the controls there are a lot less smokers in general uh, the, the thing is uh, I have received actually two questions about the same topic one from Professor Arshad Hassan he said that not just smoking also the health seeking behavior and oral hygiene habits of two groups can be a confounding factor and also another question from Professor Farhan, he said that in fact, current smoking and history of CVD is more responsible for MI than any other variable in this study. So what do you think about these two comments? So of course, if, if you smoke, you have a more unhealthy lifestyle, and that means that you could also naturally have other lifestyle factors that's contributing to the myocardial infarction, as well as uh, a more, how should I say, worse dental health. And mm -hmm. at least in Sweden, um, there is some evidence that uh, there is those who are within the um, blue collar workers that smoke more than white collar workers today. Um, so, so uh, of course, uh, smoking could be, uh, could be an indicator of all kinds of disease um, readiness, regardless the disease, the, regardless the, disease, the disease. That's the answer for the, the first one. So that's, a, that's, that's correct. Um, so it was actually, uh, um, if the groups were more balanced in terms of the smokers, uh, maybe you could have ruled this one out. Yeah, in but if we had done, group. yes, but, but if you have done that, we would never have founded these 1600 patient, patients and controls within four years, because a lot of those yeah, and my in, in Sweden are smokers, as well as they are men. Men is also age groups. Women are protected, predict, uh, are protected until menopause. Professor Thomas, please. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I, of course, it's the. I think the good thing with this study is that we we actually used uh, smoking as a confounder in the statistical analysis. So we, we adjusted the model in the logistic regression analysis for smoking, the effect of smoking. Since we knew that uh, those with the myocardial infarct were more uh, frequently smokers. So that was included in, and that is one of the, I think one of the good things that with this study that we, we had control over some of the confounders at least, some, some of the important confounders which are listed in, 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 in table one in the paper. So uh, I, I think that the only way that you can handle it really because 
the other way, uh, since it's it's a it's a it's a patient control match control groups, uh, uh, so you, you can't do it otherwise I, because otherwise you have to try try to make it some kind of other uh, study design. I think. Okay, so the, the, uh, the thing is we are worried about is the effect of these co-founding variables on the result. So uh, because uh, of all of this explanation, how do you manage to statistically uh, get rid of these co-founding variables, the smoking? Yeah, we did that by including smoking in, in the logistic model. So mm -hmm. there was an adjustment for that when we did the, if you, if you have a look at the, for example, in the, the figures and the tables, let's say for example, the figures, uh, the figure one, then you can see that there are both, uh, the odds ratios are, are crude ones and there are adjusted odds ratios. And the adjusted okay. odds ratios are taking, for example, smoking into account into the model. All right. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, and Professor and Ziad from, from Lebanon. The other, from, and, and then of course, there is, a, there is a, some kind of control of many other factors. Uh, since we did this match control, so we, they are matched with age, they are matched with gender, and they also match yes. from where, where they live. So that is sort of a socioeconomic uh, match. Factors were balanced. Same region. Because people I think we have a question in different areas. So, so if you, yeah. Yeah, Professor Ziad, please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Sure, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, I'm Ziad um, Jais from Beirut. Uh, my question is uh, there any correlation between the quality of the root canal treatment and the result if the uh, root canal treatment is uh, done according to? Uh, the objectives, if we have any uh, uh, pathology, periapical pathology or not, is this was taken uh, into consideration? Uh, we didn't uh, actually assess the quality of the root canal treatments, unfortunately. Um, a root filled tooth uh, was a tooth that had some kind of radio pack material, either in the pulp chamber or in the root canals, but we didn't put an emphasis on how well they were uh, actually filled. Um, there are studies before that have correlated uh, root filled teeth with periapical lesions to, to coronary heart disease. But, um, and of course, if you have a bad root filling, the, the, the risk of having a periapical lesion also increases, but unfortunately we didn't look at it in, uh, in this study. Okay, and there is another question in the chat room that said that is it possible to take a smaller sample size and exclude the confounding factors? And I think we already answered that by adjusting the odd ratio that Professor Thomas mentioned that, which, which means that we already exclude that uh, variables from the study. Okay, Fatima, please carry on. Okay, uh, actually, I was going to ask the uh, second part of the, uh, this sentence. Uh, a family history of cardiovascular diseases was also more common in the little bit and uh, diseases be more prone to caries because it was actually discussed in the discussion too about the cardiovascular diseases. Uh, I didn't really get all of that, but uh, the question... Yeah, I think you said that, can you think outside the box would the patients, would the patients having cardiovascular disease be more prone to caries. Yes, <clears throat> uh, I think that uh, there are other confounders that we haven't uh, been able to look at. We look at a lot of them, but uh, of course not all of them. We, I don't think we know all of them. Uh, and um, yes, uh, I think that is possible because uh, the 
the people that suffer from MI could be living a, like a, a harsher life that includes many factors. It could be diet and uh, socioeconomic factors and, and so on, and could be more prone to uh, also suffer from caries. Uh, I think that that connection can also be, be done. Yeah, because in the discussion section, actually, uh, the proportion of missing teeth and the caries um, it said that they inhibit a proper dietary intake, uh, so ca causing more uh, problems with uh, the cardiovascular system. So uh, the correlation of the weight and DMFD and cardiovascular diseases risk of each group would be really interesting to see. Uh, so this is a program and anagram uh, group. So maybe the nutritionist uh, would have been added to the subject and it would be really interesting to see the results of this. So we yes, uh, actually, the paper tries to explain the, uh, the caries uh, being an indicator of the cardiovascular diseases, but maybe cardiovascular diseases may be an indicator of caries too. So uh, I just want to think outside the box. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it could be both ways, uh, of course. Okay, uh, there, is, there is a comment Sanjay. from Professor Sanjay. Sanjay, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, as a this person is who recently yeah, this is regarding had... Fatima's out of the box question that would patients having cardiovascular disease be more prone to caries? Uh, I had MI just six months back. So uh, I can tell you from my own experience that people who had MI or history of MI are more conscious about their diet. So uh, the chances of them getting caries are actually lesser. <laughs> After MI or before MI, Prof? After yes. MI. After MI, <laughs> yes. Um. Thanks God, you're, you're much better now, Sanjay. We are happy I'm to have you between us. Yes. Okay, great. And there, there is a question from uh, Noor that if she wants actually the question herself, or he, I don't know, Noor. Oh yes, Noor, he. Please go ahead, Noor, ask your question yourself. Yeah, hi, how are you doing? Thank you very much. Please introduce yourself. I know you very well, but for others, please. Yeah, I'm now studying in Medical University, Azerbaijan Medical University, fifth course. And uh, inshallah, in the future I'll be in implantology for deep implants. Okay, uh, go ahead. Now, my, my question about the smokers people, if the percentage of the smokers people is higher than the normal, so maybe this indication for myocardia that you, you face, maybe because of smoking, not root canal inflammation. So how many percentage of the smokers people in this study is more than 50 or 60 percentage? Dan? Do you get the question? The question is maybe this indication or just because of the smoking more than the root canal inflammation. So if this it is the case, then smoking is stronger. So the correlation of a smoking is more stronger than others. Obviously we know from other studies that also smoking is a predisposing factor for myocardial infarction. I believe uh, Professor Thomas answered this question by that odds adjusted odds ratio already as well. So that is the most important part, I believe. But what do you think then? Do you want to add anything or others? No, I, I, I agree. I think that is a valid uh, concern and probably it's, it could be true uh, that smoking, of course, is uh, maybe more important than, um, than a periapical inflammation or endodontic disease. But yeah, I think Thomas uh, answered it uh, the only way we can that, uh, that we had tried to adjust for it in the statistical analysis. And, um, and then we have to take the results for what they are, I, I guess. Okay, and uh, there is also another question that they say that maybe patients with cardiovascular disease and caries, it happens just uh, at the same time without any correlation how we can prove that there is a correlation between these two. Maybe these two variables just happen simultaneously like that without any correlation. 
the two variables of endodontic disease and uh, yeah they say that the question said that patients with cardiovascular disease and caries can happen without any correlation these two variables mm. uh, yeah I, mm. well the, the only thing that we that we can measure are correlations actually mm -hmm. in kind of studies so and then there might be biases that make that correlation is is, is not correct but with the material we have that is we have match controls and we have taken into account all the possible confounders that were measured into the statistical analysis. and then we still have these correlations and that i mean it's difficult to to do so much more than that because then you are then you come into the question whether there is a causal relationship or not and that is is much more difficult and as somebody said here before it's even almost not impossible to think but i think it will be almost impossible to to perform a study a randomized control study where you have patients that suffering from carriers and periapical lesions and leave them without treatment and see if, if they compared to a group which do not have these diseases will develop more myocardial infarcts after 10, 15, 20, 25 years. So it, it, the task to do, to, to actually to study the causational relationship, I think it is, the, the, the challenge is, is immense uh, about doing that. So the, uh, the best thing I think we can do is to make good studies about correlation and try to, to compensate for, for uh, confounders and do it the best way we could. And then from that, see if the correlation are strong or if they're not so strong. And uh, from how strong they are, we can make some kind of perhaps conclusions about if there are, if there are any causational relationship. But uh, because causation is, is something that is very difficult from, from many points of view. I mean, already the, you know, all, all the antiques, they were, they were, uh, they, they didn't find out that even uh, 2000 years ago. And I don't think they, they, we have done that yet. What is causation really? It's very difficult to say. And this is, uh, I think it's so many, many factors that influence. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, fine, 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 thank you, sorry. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So let's have a break uh, because we have actually uh, a sponsor. We are going to watch one of the video from our sponsor. My colleague, please go ahead. Zohre. So while we are waiting for that uh, video to start, All right, uh, maybe maybe technically they are not connected yet, so let's see. Uh, all 
right, Fatima, please go back and share your screen with us. All right. While you are going back, there is a question again from Professor Farhan. I think, uh, Professor Farhan, can you tell your question yourself, please? Okay, why? Okay. Sure, sure. I can, I can ask my question. So I have yes, stated please. two things. The first thing is that since there is an extensive matching done on age, gender, and geographical location, so technically, one cannot assess the effect of these three variables on the outcome. So that's a technical limitation. So that's why uh, extensive matching is kind of uh, discouraged. But here they have done extensive matching. So ideally, rather than matching done on gender or a geographical location, ideally matching should have been done on smoking or history of cardiovascular disease, ideally. So that's the one point. And my second, uh, point was that uh, I had asked that people are asking about putting caries into equation, but it's um, clear that at the univariate level, caries uh, has shown no association. So it means that there is no point putting caries into equation. The data suggests in this paper that uh, DMFT and missing teeth are somehow associated, but at the univariate level. But when they took the analysis further, um, there was no association seen at the, uh, when the adjustments were done. In fact, the missing teeth variable also became non-significant when they adjusted it for periodontal disease. So it means that none of the variables turn out to be significantly associated with uh, MI. So the only variable that I think could have been important and could, ha could have turned out to be associated with MI were um, history of uh, smoking, current smoking and history of family history of CBD. But unfortunately, these two variables were not put into the equation and they were not taken forward for adjustments. Otherwise, some interesting thing could have been um, you know, uh, observed. Thank you. Okay, Thomas, do you want to answer this question or this comment or add anything to that, please? Because this is a very fundamental question, I believe. Yeah, uh, do you want to say something, Corey or John, or should? I? Yes, I, I could say something, but but please, if you want to say something first, you go ahead. I think that, uh, of course, uh, if you do the matching, you could have included also other factors for doing the matching. Uh, I think the three ones shows in the, the, the gender, uh, the age, and the geographical area are three factors that are of well-known importance for as the risk factors for uh, my, uh, heart disease, in my call infarction. So then, of course, you could have added other things, but uh, the, the, it, I think it was difficult enough to find healthy controls this way. And I think that for every healthy control that you include, I, I, I think that you had to contact at least three persons to get one. So maybe it's from, from out of 800 controls, you have contacted more than, two, more than 2,500 healthy people that you know, had a phone call and said, would you like to go to the dentist? And, uh, and, med and to the doctor and make a medical exam and make an x-ray. So it was, it was difficult enough and it's, uh, everything can be made better, but don't let the, the best things be the enemy of, of good things, so to speak. So um, yeah, so that's, that's the reason. And, I, and then I, I don't really understand what, uh, it's true that, we don't find uh, more than uh, extracted teeth as a, as a, in, in general as a, as a risk indicator. And I think that is, that is interesting enough. And I think that we, make some, we can make some uh, extrapolation from that, but perhaps that we do that when we come to conclusions. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm, I, the, the criticism is, is valid, but uh, you do as, as as well as you can, so to speak. 
Would you add Thank something? Thank you very much, Prof. Yes, I think that you yes, I think the group listening here take too much emphasis on the smoking. We have to remember that in the Kingdom of Sweden, uh, quite not that many people anymore smoke. And mm -hmm. that uh, if you look at the data, there is only basically 26% uh, of the patients and 12% of the controls that smoke. And if you look at the never smokers, from the, from the baseline as a, at admission, there is more or less the same between the patients and controls. So around 40% is never smokers. So the criticism that you raise ar around smoking is a little bit harsh, I would say, and uh, maybe not unfair as, as Thomas said, but at least I think that you take a lot uh, too much emphasis on it. Um, you also have the risk factor for, for cardiovascular disease regarding diabetes, for instance, that we haven't discussed at all. I do agree with you, but uh, I think the concern of Professor Farhan is about the number of the variables that we try actually to match them with each other. And he believes that maybe this matching on too many variables is a bit counterproductive. What do you think about that? Of course, if you take too many manufacturers in, you will not get in a good result. You have to only take in those uh, factors that actually counts. Uh, if you took it, if you take in others, it will be a, a result that is basically uh, blurring the real results. Okay, thank you very much, Fatima. Please go ahead. We need to manage the time as well. Okay. Okay. Actually, uh, I really enjoyed and understood the results by looking at the forest plot in figure one. And it clearly shows that missing teeth is a huge risk factor, uh, whereas people with filled teeth are good to go. So what I could not understand was why the teeth with primary periapical lesion rather than secondary periapical lesion were associated with an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular diseases. I think uh, many of us maybe would agree that uh, the untreated uh, periapical lesions with the infected necrotic uh, pulp and the root canal um, would it be more serious than one, the one that is actually been uh, treated, uh, however not healed. Um, but we have to remember that uh, the x-rays that we look at, uh, they only show one point in point Section. in time, and uh, we we actually don't know when the root fillings were done. Maybe we are actually looking at healing processes uh, and not disease. We we actually don't know that, but um, um, maybe the, the the inflammation, the infection is uh, is more serious in the primary periapical lesions than the secondary ones. So I think that maybe these findings actually has some kind of biological explanation behind them, if, if you would. Uh, I think, Dan, we need to be very careful about this biologic correlation because we are going just to claim that, actually you are going just to claim that this is an indicator, not the causation as Professor Thomas clearly uh, I think showed that. So we need to be very careful because when this, I think it's coming to the ask, uh, the question that Professor Ziad asked about the quality of root canal treatment. We need to be very careful about that because when we say secondary periapical lesion, that means the quality of the root canal treatment wasn't good enough to give us a good healing. However, again, this is like a cross-sectional looking at the lesion. We don't know about the previous radiographs to compare with this radiograph, maybe it is in a healing process. That the answer can be that I would say such a thing. Rather than we need to be very, very careful by claiming that this is a biological correlation. I believe such a thing. I don't know, maybe Professor Thomas or Co Professor Corey can correct me if I am wrong.
Yeah, so, yeah, so you want uh, yeah, yeah, so I think the, you are you are perfectly right. Yeah, and, and actually, yeah. the 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 question is also that if you look at this table, you, neither of them is uh, statistically significant when you exactly. Remember. So so that is the first thing that so you that is the correct answer. Neither of them is statistically significant when you look at the whole in in the whole group, and uh, I think that. But but then when you come to the sub subgroup analysis for for the young one of the younger groups that you find that primary periapical lesions is, is significant, it's inevitable that you make some kind of you have to discuss and think about possible biological uh, explanations. Yes, with the background of other knowledge, but you can't be sure, and it's. I would not say it's speculation, but it's a, it's a, it's a ed educated guessing about what could be the reason why if there is any. But in the whole, in the whole uh, material, there is no statistical significant influence of neither of them. Right. Uh, can we say that non-treated teeth are maybe uh, a more uh, risk factor rather than uh, an endodontic inflammatory disease? Uh, I wouldn't claim that. Okay. Okay, um, I've got another question, by the way. Uh, you mentioned about the age groups and my uh, next question is okay. about the age groups. Uh, because there is actually um, a part in which you actually uh, discussed about how you classified the age groups. So what I was wondering is how you did it. Um, the patients uh, in this study, they, they were all quite old. We didn't have many younger individuals. Uh, and you have to put the cutoff point somewhere. Uh, so uh, you could put it at 40. There are studies that have showed that uh, men under 40 are more prone to uh, or have a high risk of uh, uh, heart disease uh, if you have this and this variable. Uh, if we have put it at 40, according to that study, we would have had so small groups. So we had to put them somewhere. And I think that's why we decided on the 60 and then the 65 for the for the younger ones. Um, but of course you could put it actually anywhere if you <laughs> if you wanted to. And and interesting interestingly enough, you, you get different results depending on where you put this uh, cutoff point, so to speak. Um, because the younger group is actually like 30 years gap in between, and the older group is just 15 years gap in between. So well, um, how did you actually get the cutting point? Uh, for the second one where we, we had it at 65, we wanted uh, equally large groups. So that's why we, uh, we chose those ones. So we have approximately the same number of uh, individuals uh, in that one. Uh, so that's how we decided on uh, uh, on that one. Uh, and for the other one, uh, I think we just found that it was suitable to put it at, at 60 um, because there were so many older individuals in, in this study. Um, and and uh, we had uh, the, the limitation with the, the 75 and, and no older persons than that. Um, Maybe that wasn't a, a good answer, but uh, that's how we resonated when we when we did it. Uh, if you had an ideal balance group, where would you get the cutting point? Maybe it could be interesting to have an even younger group around 40 perhaps because we find uh, interesting results uh, we're looking at the younger individuals that, that suffer from uh, MI. Uh, and maybe that's where we can find uh, the strongest correlations with diseases in the mouth because those are the patients that will, will show such, such findings 
that could be correlated maybe higher uh, or maybe stronger to the, the heart disease compared to older patients that uh, they <coughs> lived a longer life. Uh, they've gathered more and more other uh, factors that uh, could play a role in their MI, so to speak. So maybe ha has, uh, have a, a younger group than, than what we have here. Okay, Professor Farhan has a question. Please go ahead, Professor. Uh, well, I don't have a question. I would like to support <coughs> Otha, uh, on a point that uh, what would be the right age group. Look at the data. The data suggests that the mean age is 62 years plus minus eight, the standard deviation, which means that 95% of the samples had the uh, were of age 45 to 78. When this uh, mean is uh, 62 and the standard deviation is eight, it means that 95% of the subjects recruited in this study were between 45 and 78. So in, the, in that case, the right cutoff was around 60, 62. So they, what they have done is correctly, is, is absolutely correct in terms of putting the bar near 60, 62. So that uh, I will support them. Thank you very much, Dr. Farhan. Thank you very much to be fair, actually, because you ask good questions and also uh, speak in favor of them as well. <laughs> Thank you. This, this is actually the nature of this discussion. Thank you very much. And my next Welcome. question is actually uh, about the age groups too. Uh, why would any periapical lesion be a risk factor for a first MI in the younger age group, but not in the patients above the age of 65? Why would you, how would you discuss this? Uh, I would uh, claim that uh, the older patients, they have so many other factors that uh, also uh, associate with with the first MI. So the so the mere presence of a periapical lesion um, may not play as big a part in 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 that uh, in the heart disease problem for that person. But for a younger person that perhaps should not suffer from a heart disease, then the the oral diseases play a, a much bigger role because they don't have all the other factors yet is my but are you convinced uh regarding the uh, periapical lesion, primary periapical lesions i mean uh is the confounding factor is just the only explanation why uh, it would be the mi uh, would be more seen uh on the younger age group than in the older age group I'm just the confounding factors. Perhaps it's it's the factors that we don't uh, have any knowledge of in, in this paper that the periapical lesions in the younger ones actually is a is a sign of a, a harsher living and uh, lots of other problems and uh, the periapical lesions is, is just a result of that, but. Perhaps not. It's, of course, maybe uh, the reason that they get the MI. We already know that we can't discuss uh, the causality in that way. But that if, if you suffer from MI at a younger age, then you also live a harsher life that affects the mouth and could present itself in this way by showing more periapical lesions. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Thomas, do you have anything to add to this uh, justification? I, <clears throat> no, not, not really. I think that Don answered it. We, we don't know. We can only make, you know, educated guessing about the, the correlation. It's, for me, it seems, it seems uh, let's say, from some fundamental biological knowledge about how people are and how, how we people are. If, if you are in, in younger age, have a lot of problems with your teeth, it's more likely that that could affect your general health uh, in comparison with those who are a little bit older because they also probably have more other health problems that also could affect the, the general health and um, 
vortices and so so it's um, but it's, it, of course it's a little bit of it's it's a bit of speculation uh, and uh, but it's if we go with the other studies previously uh, study the correlation between poor oral health and general health problems are more prone in younger age groups than in older age groups. I think that's uh, the, the only things that I want actually to add to that is because we mentioned something just as a risk indicator rather than just a risk factor. So we need to be very careful about that. I think in this part of the article, uh, these two concepts are a little confused with each other because this is just a risk indicator rather than a risk factor. Am I right? Uh, excuse me, Muhammad. What, what, what yes, is the you're right. What, what is the difference between an uh, indicator and factor? Yeah, because I'm trying to say that when we see a young person with a lot of decay or a lot of missing teeth, okay, this can be an indicator of a lot of things, indicator of bad hygiene, indicator of bad behavior, or a lot of things. So it's not just the cause of the MI because they may have a lot of other problems at the same time. So it's back to the uh, general hygiene as well. So therefore it is just an indicator. As I said, like when I, I, when I cough, people think, okay, we need to be very careful. He may have COVID, something like that. So cough is not the risk factor for COVID. Virus is the risk factor for the COVID. Coughing is just an indicator. It's just a sign, a sign. something like, like that. that. So I'm, the, the maximum things that I can accept from this article, from this correlation is, okay, the preapical lesion or the endodontic infection or missing teeth can show something to us. And we need to be very careful, especially if they are young, that they may have other issues as well. Uh, if, if I'm wrong, please correct me. It's just like a concern that I have. I, it's, it's perhaps it's because um, uh, we are. I'm, I'm at least not. Uh, I'm not have English as mother tongue. I, I, I don't really see the the distinction so clearly between a risk factor and a risk indicator. But uh, um, I, I see. I, I, th I think I get your point. I get your point. Yeah. Yes, I, I would say that you're right. That of course, peripheral lesions are risk indicators. Yes, it's not a risk factor. Um, okay, so, thank uh, you very much. So, I think that is the most answer. important thing. Okay, Fatima, uh, please. Uh, by the way, I know that it's getting late, uh, especially for those um, who are in, out of the time zone. So um, this is my final question, actually. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, because I really do wonder how uh, the dental treatments work in other countries. So um, as far as I saw, there is no difference in between groups in terms of education. Um, if so, what might be the main reason for patients who had more decayed teeth or more teeth with peripheral lesions not to go to the dentist than the control group? So um, what, what might be the reason is the dental care costly or covered by the state in Sweden? Because they're all equally educated groups, but one of the groups have more caries. Uh, the dental treatment in Sweden is costly. It's uh, partly covered uh, by the state, but uh, uh, it's still, uh, it requires uh, quite an income uh, if you need lots of treatment. So uh, definitely, I think that could uh, be a difference between uh, different people, how, how much uh, money they have and, and are uh, able to spend uh, on their teeth, uh, which could um, affect uh, these results that uh, that people that do not seek uh, dental treatment uh, could have more decay. They have less uh, 
feelings uh, which we have seen in the results could perhaps and more missing teeth at the same time by the way yeah true true because uh, yeah you go to the dentist and that's where you lose your teeth uh, absolutely um, but um, yeah the, the dent dental treatment is costly here in sweden uh, it is uh, so okay. Dr. Perhan has a question or something to add. And please, Doctor, unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, see here. I would, uh, I, uh, I would rather support the author on one th on one, on another point. That here, uh, look at the data. The data suggests that uh, the missing teeth are nothing but a proxy of a periodontal disease. And here, the difference in the group is because of the periodontal disease, uh, the missing teeth, right? And uh, why periodontal disease is different? Because since you have not, the, the authors have not obtained data on attachment loss, probing depth, bleeding, bleeding on probing and things like that. So uh, we know I that- I think that's people, another study. Yes, it's a different study altogether. So here the difference is coming from missing teeth and missing teeth is nothing but a proxy of periodontal disease, right? Rather than uh, having caries or DMFT, here, missing teeth are because of the periodontal disease, periodontal uh, uh, issues. No, we actually, don't know that, sir. Yeah, we don't know that. No, you can. With the help of data, when you see, when you adjust for periodontal disease, the effect is nullified, which means that it, it, the factor that is playing behind the curtain is periodontal disease here. So it's a strong indication there. Well, actually, in the article, it says that uh, the tooth loss, the reasons for the tooth loss uh, are not known, are unknown, actually. Exactly. But here you can get, get some idea because when you um, assess the effect of uh, missing teeth, it's initially significant. But when you account for periodontal disease, suddenly the effect is nullified, which means that periodontal disease is operating and is somehow responsible for that effect. So there is an indication. Uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Nekufar, uh, please unmute yourself first. Professor Ziad, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, again, I have a question. We know that from the main causes for MI are uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, and uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, all these factors. Uh, and in general, we know diabetes in general are uh, correlated with uh, caries, with uh, uh, teeth problems. Were these factors excluded uh, from uh, uh, the sample or uh, the selection of the patients? Uh, the, the <clears throat> diabetes uh, was added as a confounder in the statistical analysis because we had uh, data on, on that. Um, the other ones that you mentioned, uh, I don't think we, uh, uh, we didn't include, uh, but diabetes was uh, added as a confounder and uh, as such, it should be adjusted for in the, in the results. Yeah. But I agree that the, the diabetes could could lead to more uh, more carriers and uh, multiple infections and so on. Yes, Professor Sanjay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, before I say something, I would like you to know that Dr. Farhan Raza is the General Secretary of uh, Association of Operative Dentistry and Endodontics of Pakistan, and also one of the counselor of APEC. He recently I contacted him for one of his papers. Uh, anyway, coming to this uh, particular topic, uh, I must congratulate uh, Don and the team. See, if you are talking about any systemic disease like CVD, there are 40 confounding factors. Mm -hmm. So you can't account everything in one paper. We are dentists. We are not, uh, you know, cardiovascular surgeons or uh, uh, 
so I think they have done a very decent job and uh, brought in the main factors. And uh, uh, it also opens up an avenue for us to do future studies. If you want to exclude something, exclude and do another one. I think they, some of us were very harsh on them, especially regarding smoking. I think uh, they have done a fa fabulous job. Uh, there are limitations in this study. But uh, I think uh, my, my congratulations to Don and the team. They have done a good job. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Obviously, it is, it is somehow we try actually to make this discussion for our student, for the sake of our student that they are here. We, are, we, are, we say that we are going actually to make something for a better discussion. It's just like that. Uh, obviously, this is a very difficult study, very difficult. You should be very brave to initiate such a thing. Obviously, and, and, none and, of us and, are brave and, enough to do such a thing. Yes, and in endodontics, we don't have enough evidence. You know, the problem absolutely. is in endodontics, the level of evidence is very, very low. And it is one of the best article. And you know that when we choose some article to discuss, it must be an evidence-based study, which we congratulate. Uh, Professor Kist for uh, this group and also Dan for to be brave enough to start such a thing. And thank you very much for from Corey and Thomas and also Dan to accept our invitation. I know you are very brave to put yourself in this situation, <laughs> open yourself and expose yourself to a lot of questions like that. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Sanjay, I, please. I also uh, must appreciate them for having such a large sample size, you know, in a country like oh, India. Yes. Having this size is uh, okay, but in a country like Sweden, I must appreciate they must have done a lot of work actually. Okay, there is a question from Professor Zagar. Uh, Professor Zagar, please. With warmest greetings to my colleagues and professors, uh, I want to help to writers. I think writing this kind of articles, uh, such as case controls or retrospective studies or cohort studies, uh, are, are so hard. And I think that digesting this matter is harder. <laughs> uh, but according to the case control studies checklist, uh, the study design should be primarily mentioned till readers know the level of evidence and this title I think have a heavy burden. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're right. So that was the main things that we asked them maybe in the future to uh, mention the, the methodology, even in the title. So that helps all the readers to uh, not increase their expectation from the results as well. Okay, we have Professor Ibrahim Abu Tahun, and we have actually, we usually ask Professor Abu Tahun at the end actually to give us his comment. He used to be the president of APEC and also the dean of the educational committee before Professor Sanjay Miglani. Professor Ibrahim from Jordan, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Mohammed, you and uh, the great Fatima, our good friend. One more great session with you again. First of all, uh, I want to tell you, sorry, you cheated me. You told me we'll start at eight and you start at seven. And then you oh, said, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is number one. Second thing, I want to con congratulate uh, the authors of this article, a really great article. Um, and if I want to conclude, because you discussed a lot of uh, things which are really valuable, I would say that um, um, we believe now that a qualified root canal treatment, the effectiveness of this qualified treatment is very well established which means that it will reduce the risk of heart disease. It will reduce the risk of cancer. It will reduce the risk of complications. So in my opinion, whatever the variable are, variables are, the starting point is uh, starting point for disease and starting point for cure is the root canal treatment itself. And uh, this means that our prime concern would be not to focus on the technical aspects of root canal treatment as shown on the radiograph. These are nothing. These white lines are white lies. I think most important should be to focus on disinfection. This, this is my first uh, thing I, I want to say. And the second thing is that um, 
uh, Mohammed, you discussed something very important, which is the cause and effect. Cause and effect, which is the uh, combination of um, action and reaction. This is a mutual, uh, let's say, uh, combination or relationship between two or more things. The uh, documentary of Netflix you have discussed today was very clear. 97% of the women who had root canal treatments had breast cancer. But again, at the same time, it is normal because all of them, they are in the age between 50 and 75. And the, the highest incidence of root canal treatment is usually in this age. This is number one. I would say that all these women, in my opinion, had uh, skin wrinkles. So could I sta state that uh, skin uh, wrinkles uh, are the cause of cancer in these patients? In these, uh, in these uh, ladies with breast cancer? I don't think so. Uh, so I agree with you, Mohammed. Maybe we should explore in the future more and more the underlying uh, re re reasons, the underlying uh, relationships between these variables, these extra confounding variables, which, uh, which are more important. Now they are discussing the theory of Tak Takihashi. They are criticizing it that he doesn't consider the confounders of disease. Uh, they don't believe now that bacteria is, is the main cause for endodontic disease. And if there is no bacteria, there is no endodontic disease. A lot of discussion now in the literature on these topics. But uh, I, I would uh, end up saying that, thank you again. You are the star of the uh, educational committee. I want to thank also uh, Dr. Fatima. I'm really happy to see here, Dr. Sanjay and all my colleagues and also the authors. Thank you very much, Mohammed. One more great session with you. Thank you very much, Professor Ibrahim. And I think Fatima is going to end with a very important question from Dan. Fatima, go ahead, ask your question. I know yeah, this is uh, the last question. Yes, uh, actually this is an additional question. Uh, what kind of stuff in the dantic inflammation is a causal cardiovascular disease? I think we cannot hear Fatima very well, but in as I can see, okay, repeat it, please. Uh, what kind of a study should be conducted to see if the uh, endodontic inflammatory disease is a causal and direct factor for myocardial infarction in an ideal world? Uh, in an ideal world, of course, we should uh, maybe aim to try to do a, a randomized clinical trial and in this um, here maybe we could uh, we could have a, a patients with periapical infections or endodontic disease that some we treat and some we do not uh, and that we collaborate with uh, the medical field and do uh, physical examinations and follow these patients for uh, a period of time to see if they will eventually suffer from a myocardial infarction or not uh, and do uh, the, the physical examination as well and see if we can find differences between uh, these groups but we would have it would be very difficult to do it because we we need lots of patients and we need lots of time to be able to evaluate the, the incidence of uh, such uh, events, such as myocardial infarction, and um, maybe that would be very difficult to do. But um, by including also the medical um, examinations and uh, maybe surrogate endpoints instead of myocardial infarction, we could get somewhere. <laughs> that, I think that would be uh, interesting, but uh, difficult. And ethically, uh, maybe... Uh, even more so if possible. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody. I think it is too late and we need to, uh, we are going actually almost to close the session. Before uh, we close the session, we're going to say thank you very much uh, from Fatima Batul Bashturk. And uh, this, from now we are going to send this certification by post to her as well. But now uh, I'm going to ask all of you to turn on your microphone, put your hand together for Fatima Betul Bashturk, our appraiser today. Thank you very much, Fatima. Thank you.
Thank then you very I'm much. Going, Thank with you the very permission much, from Professor Thomas and Professor Kure to thank their student, their brilliant student, brave student, Dr. Dan Sabring. So Dan, thank you very much. However, I think this is the certificate for Professor Kist, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to say first for Dan. Thank you very much, Dan. And we are going to put our hand together for Dan. Dan, you did a very, very great job. Congratulations. The future of endodontist needs somebody like you to be brave enough to produce and create such an amazing evidence for the future generation. And uh, we, we really appreciate your acceptance uh, in this session as well. And uh, I don't have enough for to say thanks to Professor Kist and Professor Cora Bolin, because I can say that I'm, I'm one of the students as well. I, so especially looking at the publication when I was young, I, I, however, I'm still young, uh, but, but when I was young in the, uh, the board exam, many of the articles that published by Professor Kist and his co-workers was the publication that we, it was mandatory publication for us to read them and to put them together for ourselves. So this is a great, great pleasure, Professor Kist, to see you even in this, uh, virtual way, then thank you very much. You are very humble to accept our invitation and hopefully we can also learn more and more from you. So if you want to have some word, please go ahead. Uh, I, I, I would like to thank you for in, inviting us. It's been a very interesting session and I, I saw that also there was a lot of participants and I, I, I really appreciate that you invited us to let us discuss this paper with its pros and cons this night <laughs> and uh, i hope that we can see each other again soon in the future thank you for all the yep. kind words to me and Corey and don and uh, thank you once again and hope to see you soon thank you very much Corey. please you go ahead i can just agree with what my colleague just said i i, I have liked it a lot and i think that uh, uh, these fruitful discussions about the about the article with the pros and cons that all articles have will encourage us both you you and us to have better studies and better conducted studies in the future and that is what it's all about to to conduct good research and in the long run also in make better health for with better um, so thank you so much thank you very much indeed and we put together our hand for all the authors again before we say goodbye uh, I'm going to ask uh, the secretary of APEC uh, Dr. Uh, Mohsen Ramazani, he has got something to announce. Dr. Ramazani, please. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you, good night uh, to everyone. It is 10, 12 p.m. in Iran. And uh, on behalf of APEC, I should thank uh, all in persons responsible for this uh, uh, fruitful and informative discussion, our discussion as Mohammed Hussain Kupar said. And uh, I hope uh, to continue this kind of conversations and scientific conversation in such a uh, fact, uh, random circumstances these days in the world. Uh, thank you again. But uh, there is something here that uh, Professor Nekover had led me to mention in case of the International Fifth Symposium of the Iranian Association of Endodontists, uh, which is focusing on two most uh, South Fields of Endodontics, which needs much more focusing, uh, which are vital pop therapy and the regenerative endodontic procedures that uh, about which I am uh, serving all endodontists worldwide as the scientific chair. Uh, if I have time, I can show you some uh, documents regarding this uh, symposium. Do you let me, Professor Nekofa? 
Um, if you just send us some information, then I can uh, uh, disseminate that to all the group that we have. So that can be in the future, because it, as you mentioned, it is too late for some of us. And uh, yeah. I promise actually to finish on time. And therefore, if you let me, I will uh, circulate all the information in most of the group that we have uh, for them to know about your symposium. The symposium that uh, Mohsen mentioned is also, uh, I think, propagated on EFI and also APEC website as well. But I will send that information to you as well. But Mohsen, you can share the poster or share the program if you like. Yes, yes, yes. OK. Just uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Can you see? Not yet. So please let me let me share my screen. Can you see now? Yeah, we can see the screen. Just your screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's 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 seen actually. Okay, now it's seen. One. Yes, no, no, the previous one. Can okay. we see now the poster of the symposium? Yes, yes. we can see the poster, it's, it's, which yes. is on the. This is the poster. This is the poster supported the, officially by the APEC, um, and also the web down. You can see five. Fifth in the same thought IR. All information is there for you. You can see easily and uh, follow. And uh, this is the list of speakers. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me mention some of them Professor Periroch from Iran, Professor Yuji Huang from America, Dr. Asadian, Professor Bakhtiar, Professor Sheikh Nizami, Professor Wadusi, Professor uh, Fazla from Iran, Professor Kartikian from India, Professor Sabiti from USA. Professor Zandi from Norway, Professor Azar Pashu from uh, Canada, Professor Nesrin Eitaha from Jordan, Dr. Khazai from Iran, Dr. Bucci from Chile, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Jarrett from Thailand, Dr. Meraji, and Professor Jafarzadeh from Iran, and also Professor Nekufar, you can see here, from Iran, Professor Mahmoud Rabinijad, all of you are uh, sufficiently aware of him. He is the inaugural presenter of the symposium, please us and uh, see his lecture. Professor uh, Talal Nahlavi from Syria, Professor Cardinali from Italy, Professor Kawashima from Japan, Dr. Uh, Paris Carr from Iran, Professor Meschi from Belgium, and uh, Professor Askeri from Iran. These are the, in fact, presenters of the scientific lectures in this uh, symposium. And uh, let me show just a very, very short clip and then uh, uh, finish my words. Sorry. It is not paid, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I think for some technical reason. Okay, thank you very much and hope to be able to see you all uh, in the Iranian symposium as well. Yes, um, the time is of the time of symposium is uh, first to fourth of March, 2022. And it is virtual meeting, which is to be held on Zoom cloud meeting platform. All of you are officially and sincerely invited to this meeting. The information will be Send to you via the professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohsen, for the information. And we are going to end the session by just uh, broadcasting uh, another video from our sponsor. Thank you very much, all. Have a very, very good evening and good night. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Okay, guys, thank you very much, all of you. See you in three weeks for our next session. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye, bye, thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.